No. <laughs> I think maybe we could turn it down a little. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Bellingham First Congregational Church, and welcome to you in the bigger balcony. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. I'm Pastor Paige. It's still a bit loud, Georgia. Thank you, Mary. I'm here with Pastor Sharon. My pronouns are she and they. I just want to say to you this morning, whoever you are, whatever you might believe, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here with us. Your presence makes us whole. Let's worship. The story this morning comes to us out of the book of Matthew, Matthew 5, uh, 38 through 48. And whenever I get the ch chance to choose a text, uh, you can bet that it will be the Magnificat or somehow the Sermon on the Mount, because those are my favorites. One thing scholars will tell you about any book of the Bible, but particularly those in the Second Testament or the New Testament, is that they must be understood within the social, religious, and political context of the day. And so as we listen to the words of Matthew 5, we need to remember that the people in Galilee who Jesus was speaking to had a fresh memory of their ancestors having been enslaved. And they had lived through generation after generation of imperialist domination and subjugation. Their life was one of excessive taxes and fear at that time of the Romans. Enter Jesus, the teacher. Matthew 5 tells us how Jesus arrived on the scene and then shows Jesus as the rabbi, the teacher of the Jews. His first words to his community were to repent to repent, it means to change our mind, to see things new. It's one of those words that many of us have stepped away from because it reminds us of a childhood faith that wounded us, but let's talk about it in a new way. Repent can mean to change our minds simply. And then Jesus goes on in the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes and the instructions about living a life that follows in the way of the kingdom of God with a description of the reign of God. Not as something that's out there in some future time, but here and now. The power of God was present to the people of the Galilee, of Galilee. It was a new way of living. Metanoia, the kingdom, the kingdom. God's dream for who a people could be, how a people could govern themselves, how they could interact with the stranger, with those who had wounded them, with their friends, with their family, in a way that was resisting the hatred and violence of Rome. It was a new way of being. I would love to invite any children or young folk come forward and join us here. Wait, our pillows are missing. 
what are we going to do without our pillows? Oh, we'll have to find them at some point. If you're worshiping in the bigger balcony, please, if you're a young person, join us. Get ready. I've got some questions to bring to you this morning. <sighs> well, my first question is actually going to be for Josh. Testing. 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 Oh, here, let me turn it on. Oh, it's not on. <laughs> <laughs> See, not this is, I know. All right. There we go. All right, so question for Josh first, all right? Hi. Josh, do you remember any teachers that were particularly special to you or that you appreciated? Uh, yeah, I had an AP US history teacher in high school who was like really cool and I still remember most of the stuff she taught just because she was like a really good teacher and stuff. Oh wow, that's amazing. Okay, so it was in high school. So you remember this from a long time ago. Oh, I, 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 I'm not that, I don't know. Yeah, I guess it's a little bit ago, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, what about you though? Do you have any teachers that you really appreciated? I actually, so I was thinking about this because I was preparing, and the one that popped into my head first was my fourth grade teacher. Her name was Mrs. Mayarello, and none of us were able to say Mrs. Mayarello. And so the whole first day of starting fourth grade, almost the only thing we did was have to learn to say Mrs. Mayarello. And Mrs. Mayarello was such a tough teacher. She was so hard. But the reason that I appreciated her so much is that I could also tell that she really cared, mm -hmm. that she didn't mm -hmm. want any of us to feel like we couldn't do something. And that's kind of why she made us all practice her name. So she could show us on the very first day that we could all do this. <laughs> yeah. So did you ever get to tell that AP uh, history teacher how much you appreciated her, Josh? Uh, I, I don't know if I really ever had the opportunity. Like, I think she knew that, like, the class thought she was awesome, but, like, she, she ended up moving to Spokane after mm. that year, so I didn't really get to see her that much again. Yeah. Uh, Hi. What about you, though? Did you ever get to tell Mrs. Maiorello uh, <laughs> how much she meant to you? Well done, yeah. Um, no, I didn't, because when I was in fourth grade, I didn't even think about doing that at the end of the year. And now it's been so long ago, I don't have a clue where she is. So, no, I never got to tell her. Gotcha. Well, now it's time to ask the kids up here and go ahead and share if you can think, do you have any teachers, you know, from your time at school or your time at church or anywhere else that you feel have been really helpful to you? Yeah, Brennan. Well, there is a teacher in second grade that's literally retiring. She was, yeah, in sec yeah, um, she was my teacher in second grade. She was really pushy back, mm -hmm. but you know, she has helped me prepare me for grade and fourth grade. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Brennan. Yeah, nice. that's awesome. That's great. Anybody else? AP psych teacher, Mr. Vieira. I feel like he knew so much about psychology that he understood all of our psychology. Because oh. he was just like the most understanding. I think the biggest thing about him was how empathetic he was. Mm. You could tell he truly cared about students. And yeah. he definitely put us before like other things, but he's also a great educator. Like everyone mm. in the class was really on it gave us all the resources we needed, super organized. Yeah. He would bring us snacks. I remember that was one thing that oh. I thought really showed how much he cared is he always had a box of granola bars in his classroom for yeah. students. Um, oh. Like he would always bring us, and people would just devour it too. Like I don't know how much money he spent <laughs> on that, but it was a lot. Um, oh. And yeah, he was really sweet. Great. Thank you, I think Henry, I think you had something you wanted to share too, right? Uh, Oh, thank you, Henry. Yeah. Isa, how about you?
Yeah. Thank you, Mia. Yeah, Miles. I love that. I love that. Anybody who didn't get to speak yet want to share? I think we're all going to share just one, okay? Yeah, thank you. I was hearing two. I was just saying I'm not as passionate about it as Mia. Yeah. Personally, I was thinking great because this church gave us candy. Yeah. Well, today's story um, that is from the Bible, is about how some, some ways that we're kind to each other, ways that we can be together in community. And I think that being able to say thank you is one of those things that makes being in community really great. You know, So being able to um, tell people the ways that they were kind to you, whether they brought granola bars or were really empathetic or... Um, you know, love books and shared their love of books with you, whatever it was, to be able to say thank you really makes a difference. And um, even though I never got to say thank you to Mrs. Maiarello, I can still say thank you to the other people in my life now, right? So I can remember now. Um, and I know that Josh, you have been thinking about those people who kind of helped get you started here at First Congregational, because you all, I don't know if you remember, but this is Josh's first year uh, as our church school coordinator, and so they needed people to help them, even though they were an adult. Were there some people that you wanted to say thank you to, Josh? Yeah, definitely. There were a lot of volunteers and just, you know, parents and everybody who I'm super appreciative of. I don't think the church, or I know the church school program wouldn't have been nearly as successful or successful at all without them and their advocacy for, in the first place for even having a church school program. So I would like to invite the, uh, you, if I say your name, just go ahead, stand up, and you can stay standing up if you feel comfortable with that. So let's see, uh, Tammy, Jean, Nancy, Paula, Amelia, Scout, Maddie, Margie, Jen, Renee, I think is outside setting up, and Jessica, those are a few names of the wonderful people who helped uh, with the church school program. And the, you know there are other people whose names, I'm sorry if I didn't say, who have helped support the program. And if I didn't say your name, you can, of course, are welcome to stand up. Yeah. Yeah, is there anybody else? And if you're in the bigger balcony, worshiping online, you know, put something in the messages saying, I, I supported church school this way this year because we like to be able to acknowledge that. Okay, I know you all have sat down already, but would you stand back up again, please? And those of us who have been part of church school in some way, stand up and look out at these people, if you would. Tell me, oh, yep, there's Jen, and yep, yep. Would you stand up and look at them? Do you know that some of these people? Like, you know Maddie and Paula and Tammy and Scout, you know them. Would you be willing to just say a big thank you all together? Turn around and look at them. Come on. Come on. Let's look at them. And we're going to say a great big thank you on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Thank, thank you. you. And as you go to church school, we're going to have these folks still stand up because you can take um, a bookmark to each of them just so that they can remind themselves that they were part of this and they made a difference in your lives. So I'm going to pray, and then you're going to hand out the bookmarks, okay? God, thank you for teachers and thank you for learners. Thank you for this community where we can grow and learn from one another and from you no matter what age we are. Amen. All right. Let me turn this off. Oh, thank you. Okay, one second. Okay, while the bookmarks are being distributed, I just wanted to give you some light instructions for the hymn we're going to sing together. Um, what does our God require of you? We're going to sing it all together once first, with repeats, and then we're going to break into two sections. So this will be the first section here that will sing it around. So you will sing 
um, led by Sharon, the first part of the round, and then you sing it through again, same way, and then I will lead you as second part of the round. All right, should be pretty straightforward. If you look in your bulletin to the community prayer, we're going to begin as a community together. First, all voices, starting. God of love, we need you now. Teach us to love those who have learned to hate and to pray for our enemies. Teach us how to stop the cycle of harm and embrace compassion. God of joy, we need you now. Receive our burdens as they are many. Lift our spirits, they are weighed down. God of life, we need you now. Grant us grace where shame restricts us and life where pain takes hold. May we grow in wisdom and compassion, reflecting your love to the world. Amen.
Today, as we bring prayers, I invite us to pray for and with our graduates that we'll be honoring soon as they prepare for what is next in this life, what is coming. It is a time of both joy and challenge as they enter into new things. Um, I invite prayers also for gratitude for all of those church school participants, all of those who volunteered their time, spent their time with the young people this past year. So thank you and gratitude for that. What else are you praying for this morning? I invite you to, if you, if you have asked permission, you can say the name of whoever you're praying for, or you might simply say my friend or whatever else. Um, but what are you praying for this morning? Safe travels and wonderful companionship for Evan and his mom who are on a road trip together. Thank you. I'd like to pray for all the parents who supported or caregivers who supported their children through school and now are looking to support them in this life. <laughs> for all of the parents and adults who have supported the kids in their school time, and for what's coming next. Thank you. Jeff. For dear friend. Thank you. For your dear friend, Joanna, who has died for all of her family and friends who have loved her and miss her. Thank you. Tina. I would like prayer for a Colorado friend, CJ, who has had a really hard burn accident on Saturday. For CJ, who had a very hard burn accident this past week. Thank you. Mona. I pray for prayers of healing for our niece Sarah and her husband Mike, who survived a horrific accident last weekend and their car turned over three times. Mm -hmm. And uh, praise God. <coughs> For Sarah and Mike, who are healing following a terrible accident, um, thanks be to God that they are both able to heal and are. And celebrations for your 40th wedding anniversary this past week. Thank you. If these are all our spoken prayers, did I miss some? Oh, please. I would like to offer a prayer for our country in the weeks and months ahead. A prayer for our country in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you so much. Let's gather all that we have heard together with those prayers that we hold silently within us and those prayers that have been added to the bigger balcony. Let's pray in silence.
Holy One, this time of year brings so much celebration, so much that we can look back on and appreciate and say thank you for. And it brings so much trepidation as we look forward. And sometimes that trepidation is anxiety and sometimes it is simply the bubbling up of expectation, of excitement. And God, all of this is in our lives nonstop, the high, the low, simply being. And you are with us throughout. Thank you, God, for this community that holds our prayers with us. Thank you, God, for your presence no matter where we are. All of this I pray in your many names, and we join together our voices saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 38 to 48. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, Give your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to the one who asks of you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of God. For God makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your siblings, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as our loving God is perfect. If anyone would like to join me in the response, I would welcome that. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Megan. Will you pray with me?
loving God, take the words of my mouth, of the meditations of my heart, and make them speak your truth and love. My rock, my redeemer, and the ground of my being. Amen. When Sharon and I first sat down to talk about my time as interim, first I was thrilled. I'm really glad to be back here with you all. But I was also drawn to this sermon and the topic of kindness. The fact that we have a crisis of kindness, a shortage, a loss of the skills of kindness is not news to me. Shirts emblazoned with kindness and memes about being kind feels aspirational to me. Even my own comments to my children about kindness being the central value of our family feels more hopeful than a reflection of something we have achieved. <laughs> Certainly when it comes to the way the kids treat each other in this season of childhood, we are not there yet. And in my daily work, I can feel like I go from one school, one district to the next, just begging grown-ups to be a little more gentle with vulnerable, afraid, lonely kids. I've come to see my work as being much bigger than advocating for LGBTQ youth. I am trying, it seems sometimes, just to reteach simple kindness. Trying to bring a sense of humanity to a topic that has been so weaponized and dehumanized. Helping others see that we can, even in the midst of great chasms of difference across politics and religion, and life experience, even still find common ground and work together toward a shared vision of a better world. And you might be surprised that I often have an easier time working in more conservative areas than I do in the, quote, liberal or progressive ones. Most folks in conservative spaces have come to accept the fact that LGBTQ youth are. They exist. They aren't going away, and they deserve better than we've been doing for them. So in these conservative spaces, with fewer resources and less access to information, they are eager to hear from me. They have great questions, and they're inspired to make big changes. Sure, there's usually someone in the back who will sit with their arms crossed and their heart closed off, both to what I'm saying, but I can only hope that the way I model sincere respect for them and a genuine love for kids and a real live common ground with them, that they will leave with some sort of lasting impression that leads them to reevaluate their position, even if just a tiny bit. The challenges I face with the progressive set are harder to overcome. They believe they have done the work. And in truth, very often they have done some work progress toward a safer and more inclusive environment. But when something goes wrong, or there's something new that comes along, they can be a bit closed off. Instead of being open to a new idea or that they might have something to learn, they get defensive. They restate what they've already done at great cost to themselves, and then they draw a new line in the sand. These folks have more intellectual reasons for looking an LGBTQ kid in the eye and refusing to give them what they need. Some reason like grammar, fear of a political backlash, or even a zero-sum view of equality. If you get too much, kid, I can't help these other kids. This is human nature. This is human nature. When we are tired and worn down and someone comes along and says, do more, learn more, stretch again, it is natural to push back. Make excuses, justify our position. We all do this. I find myself feeling this way when a young person corrects my language. In my head, I'm thinking, I do so much for you, and I've been out since before you were born. <laughs> Both of which are true, and also not the least bit helpful to say aloud. So yeah, I think about kindness a lot, and that's just in the spaces immediately around me. I've taken a break from the news lately, working in high trauma fields, and really becoming a parent has made me so sensitive to the images and stories of suffering and loss. I'm careful about what I take in, especially when I know there's nothing I can do about some particular horror I'm witnessing. But more and more, it's the rancor I'm trying to avoid, 
and frankly, trying to avoid joining into. The political and social discourse right now is so full of hatred and division in some parts of our country. Threats of violence that force people to move out of their family home. Slander that follows someone for the rest of their life like a weight of shame they're dragging around. Permanent exclusion at the drop of a hat when someone shows their ignorant underbelly or, or just expresses a view that's nuanced and complex but maybe not popular. I'm sure we've all seen this happen or had it happen to us. Cancel culture is a real thing and it comes at us from all sides. No one political camp owns this behavior, right? And now, this is not the only sentiment flowing through our society today. There are spaces of connection, healing, and love too. And it's important that we don't lose sight of that and just become cynical and join the everything sucks crowd because that is a hopeless and apathetic dead end. What can we do when everything sucks? We feel powerless. And we can pretend that we don't participate in this division too. Raka, Jesus says, even if you say Raka to insult or call names, you have participated in the division and unkindness and have turned ever so slightly away from Jesus' vision of the kingdom. We can spin our wheels trying to diagnose the origins of this unkindness that's blasting through our country and really our world. There are reasonable places, movements, moments, and people to point to. Just stop by the library and you will see book after book attempting to spell it out and convict those who are most responsible. It's interesting to ponder and I find that if I spend too much time trying to pin down the reasons and identify the worst offenders, I miss my chance to start working toward change. I can externalize the problem, put it out there on those people, instead of asking the hard questions of myself about what I can change, what I can do better, how I can make peace. So, let's talk about that. Let's talk about we as Jesus followers, what are we called to do in the face of times of unkindness, division, disconnection, and hatred? But first, my kids. This past week, as Kristen and I were returning from a family trip to the coast, we stopped in Seattle for a slice of pizza at Pagliacci. It's a favorite, just quick off the freeway, stop for us. The kids were antsy from a few hours in the car and they were a little bit out of sorts because we'd been out of our routine for a few days and as we sat there eating they shared a booth. Mistake number one, right? Fern was reaching over and stealing the pineapple off Graham's pizza and in return he was pointing at her which is a major offense in our family. The next thing I knew she was kicking him under the table and his shoe fell off. He was wailing reaching back, now trying to push her off the booth. Leave your brother alone, both of you. Stop touching each other and just eat your pizza. Not my best parenting moment. <laughs> Usually I try to slow things down, take a breath, find a way for the kids to see one another's perspective and come up with some sort of solution together, right? But I just wanted to eat my pizza in peace so I resorted to the time-tested strategy of barking out, don't touch each other. There are harder moments still as a parent, those times when I want to crawl into a dark hole and hide. Like when one of them loudly makes comments about the unusual appearance of a stranger. Or when they refuse to even make eye contact with a grandparent who just wrote a large check for their college account. When our eldest tells a classmate that they're not friends anymore, or when our youngest is walking on the table at a restaurant, do you remember this, Tio? <laughs> Grabs the centerpiece, throws it on the floor, and it shatters, right? It can be so hard to watch, so hard to know what to say or do in these moments, so humbling to face the reality that our children are children. These two growing creatures are so little. They still have so much to learn, so many more social skills to develop, self-soothing strategies to build, so many other hard lessons to internalize before they can really be the kind of citizens of the world that we're hoping to raise. They don't mean any harm. 
They're just functioning out of a primitive instinct to survive, to get their needs met, to maintain an attachment to their caregivers, to test the limits of the world around them. Their behavior makes sense based on their age, their neurological development, and their environment. It's fun to dig into the text and see something new all over again. This time, when I was poring over the Sermon on the Mount and the instructions that follow it, I noticed how closely it parallels the story in Exodus, where Moses goes up to the mountain and hears from God and gets these Ten Commandments, like Beatitudes, right? These promises. And then a series of instructions that follow. Moses takes these down the hill and shares them with the Israelites who are in the wilderness. In Exodus, we find what scholars call the Lex Talionis, or the Law of Exact Retaliation. God tells Moses to go and share a long series of commandments with the people. It's from here that we get the whole eye for an eye thing. Then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. When I first went back and read this, it sounded pretty harsh to me, like a recipe for a whole lot of violence and grief. But scholars will tell you that the intention is to actually prevent excessive retaliation. It's more like a harm reduction strategy or like mutual assured destruction. The only thing that keeps world leaders from hurling nuclear weapons across national boundaries is the knowledge that their enemies also have those weapons and the world would be leveled. Lex Talionis. And that's when it struck me. This is what I do with my kids. I'm not always asking them to rise to the occasion. Sometimes I just want them to stop doing what they're doing. And the threat of losing a toy or sitting in timeout or getting walloped by their sibling is enough to make them think twice. It's a developmentally appropriate strategy sometimes to help them build an awareness of the consequences of their actions. It's kind of like saying, Kiddo, I know you're struggling, and the things feel really overwhelming right now, and you don't have the skills to do this yet, so I just want to give you some very clear boundaries. If someone hits you, you can hit them back, but you can't bleat, beat them to a pulp and take their cow. Got it? <laughs> just whack them and walk away. See, the Israelites were at a beginning. They had just fled enslavement. Rules had been dictated to them for generations by vicious overlords. The norms of the community that they had had before enslavement were all but lost to history, and they were making up a new society almost from scratch. In a sense, they were a young people. Their society would take generations to mature, and into this time of painful growth and uncertainty, jockeying for power, God drops in a set of rules that helps to clear bound, set clear boundaries, limits the harm that God's beloveds can do to one another, and sets them up for growth. And then along comes Jesus. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist the evildoer. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. You have heard it said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do that? In this seminal sermon, Jesus is laying out a whole new vision, a vision of the kingdom, God's dream for the world. And it's this vision, if I may be so bold, at least in this space, to say that this is what draws us together as Christians. This vision of what the world can be, an alternative to what has been, an alternative to what is, an alternative to the ways that most things and people and systems function, it's a totally different way of being. I hear Jesus saying, you know that old system that worked for us once. We all relied on that system, it did its job, but it's no longer enough. I'm calling you to something more. And this, this will define you, how you respond to your enemies, to those who hurt you or do you wrong. 
This is a call to spiritual and emotional maturity. It's no longer acceptable to get down into the mosh pit and throw punches or sling insults with the others. No. Your job, our job, is to stop the cycle of violence and be for peace. For a long time now, I've sort of imagined hatred as something like the conservation of energy. The idea that energy within a closed system remains constant. It might change states or flow to one space or another, but the level of energy is constant until something stops the flow or releases it from the system. Maybe it's turned into heat and it enters the atmosphere. Maybe it becomes light energy. Something sets it free to be used for another purpose. And when Jesus says, I say to you, do not resist the evil doer, he is saying, stop the flow. Set it free. Transform it into something else, something healing. The lesson is so simple and so difficult and frankly, so rewarding. When someone hurts you, turn to compassion and understanding, do not retaliate, but care for yourself and take what you've learned to support others. When you feel angry, direct it into healing action. Turn it into justice that feels like love. Refuse to participate in a cycle of hatred. Do not call names. This is dehumanizing of God's beloveds. Spand between those doing harm and the vulnerable. Block the blows, but refuse to strike back. To those who don't understand what you're doing, you will look weak. You may be ridiculed. That's okay. Not everyone will see things the way you do. They may use all the same words, but their vision might just be to take the power that was once used to hurt them and turn it around to hurt others. Not you. You are ending the flow of hatred and harm. You are soaking it up like a sponge and turning it into healing. You will walk away wiser, stronger, and more centered in your truth as a child of God, a peacemaker. I want to make an important point here because I know that texts like this are so easily used to further abuse, especially of women, to force people to stay in situations that are unsafe and unhealthy. I don't believe Jesus wants anyone to be unsafe or unhealthy. I believe Jesus wants us all to thrive. And I believe in accountability. When people have power, particularly over others, their unkindness must be talked about, made transparent, and held to account. Jesus knew that we would encounter times, people, spaces, moments in life that wound us, that wish us harm, that fail to see our goodness, and honestly, their own goodness. And that those times would exact a heavy toll on us. And what Jesus is saying is that if we simply return the harm and hatred, we are keeping the cycle of violence flowing. We're turning away from God's dream. Instead, we're called to stop the cycle, to end the harm, to absorb the energy and transform it into healing and hope for ourselves and others. There are reasons we are Christians, friends. They're different. For me, it isn't about salvation. I don't believe Jesus came to die for my sins. I believe that Jesus came to live so that I might have true life. We are a Jesus people, a kingdom people. We rely on the promises embedded in the Sermon on the Mount, that those who mourn will be comforted because we will help to comfort them, that the meek will inherit the earth because we value and protect the meek, that peacemakers will be called children of God because we know that God wants peace for all people and that with God, peace is possible. So be a peacemaker. Choose the way of Jesus. Amen.
I'd like to invite the graduating class of 2024 high school grads to come forward. So I'm going to have you all come up and stand kind of in front of the communion table here so folk can see you, so they can marvel that you are no longer yay high. So this is a big moment for those of us in the congregation. I know this is a big moment for you, but let us have our thing, OK? <laughs> we love getting to watch you grow up. We love getting to see old photos of you under the communion table or in other places where you have been alive and joyful as part of this congregation. This is a time when we celebrate not only that you are graduating from high school, but just the people who you are, because we simply love you for who you are. So no matter where you go, no matter what you do, you will always have a home here. This is your faith community who has watched you grow up. Yeah, OK, I'll stop. <clears throat> So some of you may be wondering, who the heck are some of these young people? Because they don't look the same as they did when they were coming up for time with children. So Tanisha Bardsley-Taylor is here at the end. And Tanisha is graduating from Squalicum High School. She's going to attend Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado. Congratulations. Yes. And Maddie Miller Malone. So Maddie is graduating from Bellingham High School, and she's going to the University of Oregon, where she, for now, plans on studying journalism. Yes. Gavery Brewer. So Gavery graduates also from Bellingham High School, and he is excited to study business and also continue pursuing the music that you love, singing. Yeah. Chloe Rapp. Chloe is going to be attending Western Washington University in the fall. Yay, we get to see you a little more. <laughs> and she is open to seeing where her learning is going to take her. Thanks be to God that you are open. Don't we all need that? Mia Kelly. Uh, Mia is playing for us this morning. So we get a little taste of that and at the end as well. Graduating from Seaholm High School and will attend, oh wait, nope, yes. Sorry, is it like an acronym? Seaholm? What? Uh, California State University of Long Beach. Yes, yes. Um, sorry. <laughs> I can't read my own writing. <laughs> So California State University at Long Beach, where she is going to be studying cello and medicine. Congratulations. That's awesome. And Ava Lane. Ava, also graduating from Seaholm. And she is going to attend Scripps College, also in California, where she plans to major in biochemistry in the pre-medicine track. Wonderful. So these are our graduates. And I want to say, um, some of you have already have your name on a prayer shawl. And I'm going to invite you to pick up the one that has your name on it. If your name is not on it yet, you get to choose. So go ahead and pick up a prayer shawl and kind of hold it. Okay, so hold this prayer shawl in front of you. And as you look at it, know that a member of this church knit this. And as they were knitting it, and maybe it was many hands that knitted it, they were knitting love and prayers, not knowing who it was going to, but preparing it specially for you. 
so that when you are in the midst of challenges and joys over these next years, we pray that you might wrap that prayer shawl around you or just hold it in your lap and remember that you are a beloved child of God. And then there's also this chime that is we on the communion table for each of you. So we hope that you will ring this chime periodically, kind of just dong sometime over the next whatever, and remember where you came from. Because this is to remind you of our church bell. I'm imagining that some of you have gotten to ring that bell over your years here. But this time is to remind you of the bell and to remind you where you come from so that you know you can always also come back. So a prayer, a blessing. Holy One, wherever this life takes Chloe, Maddie, Ava, Mia, Gavri, and Tanisha, may they always feel your presence holding them close. May they remember the love of Jesus that they have been taught in this place. And may they share it with others wherever they go. Amen. Congratulations. Oh yeah, it's time for announcements, isn't it? Well, there is a lot going on as our service comes near its close. I have several things to share with you. First, today is the last day of church school, and so you are all invited to join together for a picnic out in the children's garden. Please, um, you know, come and enjoy together. Um, We've got food. We've got fun planned. Yeah, please join us. Um, If you haven't yet signed your child or grandchild up for creation care camp, now is the time to do that. Uh, It is here at First Congregational Church, Monday through Thursday from 9 to noon, July 22nd through 25th. So if you've got someone in your life that you would like to participate um, in this creation care camp year, then please sign them up. There is signups out, I think, on the welcome desk. Next Sunday is Lucy Bledig's final day as our Minister of Music here at First Congregational, and we hope you will join us after worship to appreciate her ministry. If you are wondering what you can bring, you can see me or Frenchie Hollander. I know you're in Frenchie's over here. Thank you. Um, This coming Wednesday, there is a celebration concert at 7.30 p.m. It's featuring two of our high school graduates, Mia Kelly and Penelope Keep, who has once in a while subbed when Judy has been out, and so Penelope will be here. Um, They'll be playing solos, duos, trios with Judy, and it's all in gratitude for the Amy Wolsdorf Fund, which has made the Steinway refurbishment possible. Um, There is a reception afterwards, and friends, this is free, so please come and share in the music and celebration. The grandparents group will meet this Thursday at Old Town Cafe on Holly Street. Um, There'll be a check-in to decide whether to resume the monthly meetings in the fall, but if you, even if you haven't attended the grandparents support group yet, you're welcome to join them there. 10.30 on Thursday. Uh, Reserve your spot for the All the Way Home concert. With one accord, Saturday, June 29th, it's a fundraiser for our church's wider mission, and you must pre-register for the dinner portion, not for the concert part, but if you want to come for dinner, please register ahead. Um, And any fifth through eighth graders, if you have a fifth through eighth grader rising or finishing, Paige is planning a summer outdoor gathering, um, hopefully around her fire pit outside. Um, And so you can talk with Paige or email her, but this is for fifth through eighth graders. We're trying to get those tweens and such together for some fun outdoor time. Um, Yeah, there's a lot going on. So soak that in, listen to the music, and let's share an offering this morning.
remember that the promises of Jesus hold true for you. That we are called to be a kingdom people who stop the flow of hurt and division and step in to heal the world. Let it be so.